Welcome to the Death of the Author podcast, episode 5, your world this week in teen fiction and general geekery. You're here with Alexandra, a fictionado of all things nerdy and obscure, and Chelsea, me, writer of many unfinished things and general story connoisseur. Hey everyone! So this is the podcast for the week of November 3rd, all the way to the 16th. Woo! Yeah! Um, we have a very interesting podcast for you, but we are going to start off with our Death of the Author Reviews updates. So we've been busy. Yes. <laughs> so recently we had two episodes, two book reviews go live. We have The Raven Boys by Maggie Stiefvater, and the review covered The Raven Boys and The Dream Thieves. So it's more of an overview than a, a real review. It's setting up for our eventual upcoming Blue Lily Lily Blue review. We also released our Clariel review, Clariel being by Garth Nix. The long-awaited prequel to his Abhorson trilogy. And coming up, we have A Young Elites by Mary Lou. And the super secret movie review that I talk about every week. That she still has not gotten her hands on editing yet. It's about 10% done. It is driving me crazy. Because it, it was a week of just immersing myself in that crap <laughs> and now i just need to see it to know that it was all worth it because that messed me up that threw me off my game for like now, two weeks i'm i'm waiting through it now so. <laughs> welcome to my insanity all right so what events do we have coming up this week we have a surprise book signing by scott westerfeld neither of us knew about this i don't think even the chapters employees knew about this they were just like oh yeah he's gonna be here in a week <laughs> yeah, it was, uh, I had a coupon, actually, for chapters, and I'm like, okay, I'm gonna go, and I'm gonna get a book, and do you realize that you can walk into a bookstore and be like, I don't need to spend money today, and easily walk out with, like, hundreds of dollars worth of books, but the moment you are allowed to spend money, you're stuck in there for two hours. <laughs> it's like you're stuck, you're wandering around, it was like a horror movie. And I was just talking to one of the employees, they're like, oh yeah, oh yeah, that Afterworlds author guy, he's coming. What? Excuse me? I've been on your website so many times, I have not seen him listed there anyways. That is Wednesday, November the 5th at 7pm. At Chapters on the Queensway if you live in Toronto. Yeah. Yeah. So we will be there and we will be so, so happy. As far as we know, there are no like requirements. Like There's no wristbands, you don't have to buy a book. You just kind of show up and see what happens. Also coming up, we have, on the 13th, the beginning of the Toronto International Book Fair. Oh, yes, yes, we So do. that's another big event. We will be covering that event. I think we're both planning on being there all weekend. pretty much all weekend. We're going to hopefully have a book to meet up, so once we have more information, you'll be able to find that out on all of our social media channels. We put a video up. It's on our YouTube channel where we kind of explain more about it. We're not sure exactly where we want to meet. We don't know if we have anybody who's even interested, but... If you are interested, let us know. And there will be more updates on our YouTube channel, on our Twitter, so check us out there. Okay, so publishing announcements. So I realized last week that I screwed up and I put this week's publishing announcements in our last podcast, and I skipped a whole bunch of interesting books, so I put them in this week's podcast. So, um, on the 21st, these are the ones I missed, um, Beware of the Wild by Natalie C. Parker. I'm not exactly sure what that's about. But we also missed Blue Lily, Lily Blue by Maggie Stiefvatter. She was like, I think it comes out this week. And I'm like, I didn't see it on the calendar. <laughs> that was why. I was looking at the wrong week. <laughs> and then there's The Sorcerer's Heir by um, Cinda Chima Williams. Or Cinda Williams Chima. I always mess that up. <laughs> um, I read the series. Um, it kind of turned into like a six-part series instead of a three-part series. But... It's been good. It's nice to be returning to that world again, because it's well written. All right, so on November 9th, we have The Princess of Thorns by Stacey J. I have an interesting relationship with Stacey J. <laughs> she wrote Julian Immortal and Romeo Redeemed. On November 11th, we have the big one, The Bane Chronicles by Cassandra Clare. This is a book I've been born for, like... I was born waiting for, because Magnus Bane is probably one of my favorite fictional characters of all time. So you're just dying. I'm just so excited. Two days before my birthday, this is the best birthday present ever. Thank you, Cassandra Clare. Um, <laughs> on November 14th, the day after my birthday, is Broken by Marianne Curley, the sequel to Hidden. Now, Marianne Curley is one of our favorite authors for one of her 
previous trilogies, I've read Hidden and <laughs> eh, it's about angels. I eh. yeah, I'm I haven't been really tempted to pick it up, but I would read it anyways, just because her previous series was so good. All right, and our feature book is, as mentioned before, The Princess of Thorns by Stacey J. Game of Thrones meets the Grimm's fairy tales in this twisted, fast-paced, romantic fantasy adventure about Sleeping Beauty's daughter, a warrior princess who must fight to reclaim her throne. Princess Aurora is a fairy blessed with enhanced strength, bravery, and mercy, yet cursed to destroy the free will of any male who kisses her. That sounds really, really familiar. That sounds like... That rem- sort of truth. Yeah, that's what it reminds me of. Disguised as a boy, she enlists the help of the handsome but also cursed Prince Nicholas to fight legions of evil and free her brother from the Ogre Queen, you don't see or- ogres that often, who stole Aurora's throne ten years ago. Will Aurora triumph over evil and reach her brother before it's too late? Can Aurora and Nicholas break the curses that will otherwise forever keep them from finding their one true love? How do you feel? I'm interested. <laughs> I mean, I love fairy tales, so I'll, I'll read it, but I don't know. I, I, it, it weirds me out when the, the, the marketing thing is, guys, it's Game of Thrones, guys. I know, right? And then I love all the adjectives they use to describe this twisted, fast-paced, romantic fantasy adventure. Can we, like, pick two? <laughs> Can You can't be everything to everybody, so it's Game of Thrones meets Grim Fairy Tales. With all of the things inside? Yeah. So. Well, I'll, I'll read it. I also really like the way that they spell Nicholas. N-I-K-L-A-A-S. I'm almost not sure if I somehow managed to typo that, even though I just copied and pasted. But <laughs> I'll read this. I will read this. It, I will do this to it myself. It sounds fun. Yeah, I mean, I love fantasy, and I love fairy tales. We love fairy tales. That's so, fairy, yeah. yeah. Let's, let's give it a whirl. <laughs> okay. So then we were on we were on booktube again this week and we ended up looking at a review of The Young Elites by Mary Lou, which we kind of talked about last week a little bit. Um we've also done our review. And this one kind of really piqued our interest because she's had some things to say that we didn't have to say, but she also kind of <laughs> talked about things that we had kind of felt while reading this and we're like, Oh my god, we're, we're not, not crazy, crazy. <laughs> It was it was just like a moment where like okay we were seeing that we weren't just kind of being negative and <laughs> okay so this review is by Sophia of the book the base. book basement yeah um so she talks a little bit about kind of like the structure of the story how characters kind of kind of come off as a little flat um, which we found you you don't kind of care about all the characters you really just care about maybe Lena. She talks about um, kind of how Lena's powers grow a little bit too fast for her. Mm-hmm. Um, I was okay with the growth. Um, I, I liked the growth in the fact that because when I first thought, oh, she can just make illusions, I'm like, that's pretty crappy power. <laughs> and then just to see the extent that it can be dragged out, I really like that because it definitely played with my expectations. But I can see why someone could also find that is a little bit ridiculous. And you can also take it as her powers are growing too fast, too, because maybe her sister was suppressing them, so she never got, like, a nice little lead-up. It's like, mm-hmm. kind of like she just got access to just everything like, at once, right? So, of course, she can't handle them. But then she talks about some stuff, like, she mentions censorship, like, not as in you should censor this book, don't read it, but as in people should be kind of warned that it can get very intense at some point, and she actually needed to put the book down, like me, so I was kind of gratified to hear that. See, I surprisingly was okay with it, but... (laughs) It was, it was just the... It was intense, I'll, like... There was the one scene, and it wasn't, like that the character died it was how he yeah. died and the description of it just kind of got to me but my favorite point though that she raised was about how when female characters become badass they tend to lose their humanity because you can't be like a caring normal individual and badass heroine heroine at the same time and the more i think about it yeah that's pretty like yeah i see that a lot yeah um, she mentioned Selena from um, the, uh, I I know the first one is the Throne of Glass series. Um, I read only the first one, I can't tell you, but the rest of them. Uh, she was fine in the first one, so obviously it's a progression thing. But then there's this book. 
Um, can you think of any others? Well, it of course just made me go back to my like mainstay horror theory. Yeah. About how the final girl has to become her murderer. Yeah. And how like, you know, at the beginning they're like the vir- the virgin, you know, nice girl, and by the end of it they're just soaked in the blood of their friends and their enemy and <laughs> have... Yeah, it's there's the death of innocence and the death of humanity to survive you, yeah, to badassery. Su- to survive, you have to become the monster you were fighting. Exactly. Yeah, that's very. That's a very interesting thing to bring it up to. But then I started thinking about all the heroines that were pretty badass, that did manage to maintain their humanity. First one that came to mind was Katza from mm-hmm. Graceling. There are characters like Alana, who just are badass naturally <laughs> and you can't take that away from them no matter how much you try um but i wonder what that's a product of well i guess the same argument you mentioned alana can be made for our good friend kel from protector of the small where i think she goes in the opposite direction <laughs> <laughs> where because her she's so invested in helping other people and being like a good person that she just goes the other way and she puts herself into all this danger just to try and combat the monsters yeah and just to be a, the protector of the small she just immerses herself in humanity um she also mentioned how dark fantasy and um dystopian fantasy kind of seem to merge into one and there kind of doesn't seem to be a very very much of a difference in teen fiction at least between the two well, we did talk about it last week in the last podcast, how we're trending away from dystopian and going more along the fantasy route. And I, I kind of blame Game of Thrones because that's the really big popular TV show for the last, I don't know, four years. Yeah. <laughs> but it kind, it also makes sense in the fact that most dark fantasies are kind of dystopian because you do have the overlording government or the, the evil overlord or weird cultists or someone controlling the society is there a way to write dark fantasy without these dystopian elements i guess uh if you wanted to possibly go more fairy tale route and not deal with like the the big four you could what are the big four snow white sleeping beauty them like cinderella because they all deal with like the fairy godmothers and royalty mm-hmm. and like evil stepmothers if you were to do some like an adaptation of, I don't know, like, The Girl with No Hands. That could be dark fantasy. I feel like you're giving us nudges. You're like, hey, hey, we're doing it over here. Well, look at us. This is us. We can do it differently. Well, like, how come I just see how The Girl with No Hands always seems to be my go-to, like, <laughs> so, fairy tales, have you heard about this one? <laughs> oh, you want to write something to do with fairy tales? How about this one? Because nobody touches it, because nobody knows about it. Back to our talk about dark fantasy. Yeah, there's got to be another way, and I'm thinking there are other dark fantasy books that don't just deal with, like, kind of dystopian government elements. I just can't think of any right well, now. Well, it's because fantasy at its, like, core, you have, like, the the disposed ruler who has to get their throne back, or, like, that's such, like, a, a natural story that you're gonna come across like your antagonist is most definitely going to be royalty like the one coming coming to mind that i'm thinking about is what's it called the book i didn't like the dark jewels trilogy i'm thinking about the dark jewels trilogy where it's more focused on there is like an overarching society that needs to be fixed but the horror comes not from what they're doing to the people it's kind of what the people are doing to themselves hmm yeah. Like how corruption like kind of comes down. Yeah. I don't know. It's been an interesting talk. But anyways, <laughs> we watch this review. If you're interested in the young elites, go watch her review. It's very informative. Uh that was the book basement in Sophia. Alright. So what is our topic this week? Our topic for discussion this week is the hipster's approach to literature. Books you've probably never heard of, but you should have. <laughs> All right, let's do this. What do you got for me? <laughs> I, I just, I came up with the concept, and then I was like, what can we call this? And I'm very impressed with my title. So, yeah, a little bit of a pat on the back to me. Thanks. Okay, you give me one, then I'll give you one. Okay, well, there's some things on our list that 
we both agreed on. Yeah, and we both mentioned them already. One of them is the Guardians of Time series by Marion Curley. Oh man, I love these books. Okay, brief summary because I am on my mm-hmm. my research. Mm-hmm. So, the Guardians of Time. Ethan lives a secret life as the guardian of the named. Under the guidance of Arcarian, his mentor, and with the help of Isabel, his unlikely but highly capable apprentice, Ethan has become a valued member in this otherworldly court. As the only defense against the evil Order of Chaos, the named travel through time to prevent the Order from altering history and thereby gaining power in the pre- present and future. As the threat from the Order intensifies, secrets of the past are revealed and villains and heroes are exposed. This gripping fantasy is set in modern times, but is infused with intrigue from the past, supernatural characters, and surprising plot twists. Curly has written a winner through t- through to the end. There are three books, The Named, The Dark, and The Key, and holy crap, I love them all. <laughs> I haven't read them in such a long time. I'm almost like tempted to go back and be like, are these as good as I, I did. think they are? I did that last year because I had read Hidden and I was like, I was not really impressed with Hidden. I'm like, okay, maybe this is just, I read these at the right time. And I mean... They are flawed, but you they're see. still so good. <laughs> I love uh, them. Um, the interesting part about this series is it's told from like two people's perspectives that alternate, but it switches kind of every book, so you get kind of like six different perspectives. Mm-hmm. Um, so, and then there are characters who are kind of like ag- antagonistic in the beginning, but then you get their perspective by the end, and it just it works out. And she gave us our carrion. <laughs> Um, he reminds me actually a lot of Raphael from The Young Elites, Mm -hmm. um, but I think I kind of loved Raphael from The Young Elites just because he reminded me of (laughs) Arcarian. Um, this was an amazing series. I'm not sure how hard it is to find sometimes. It's actually, they do still have it in chapters. They do have it online. You can get it off of the book depository. Perfect. Okay, so it's still out there. Good. Um, if you have not heard of this series or heard of this author, uh, at least go check out this series because... Yes, it does have its flaws, but they are so much fun. So good. I'm going to give you all the ones I know you've read. Okay. All right. Uh, Seer and the Sword by Victoria Hanley. Yeah, I like that one. That was good. That one was very kind of fairy tale esque but it didn't feel like a fairy tale. You have this kingdom who's going around conquering other kingdoms. Um, they conquer this one kingdom who has um, like a magic sword that's supposed to be like Whoever wields it is um, unconquerable kind of thing, but they've just kind of, like, forgotten how to use it. So he kind of, like, the father destroys his kingdom and he brings back the young prince for his daughter, Torina, to be her slave. And she's like, we don't even keep slaves. Like, what, what is with you? So she frees him, like, immediately and the kid goes into the army and they become friends. Um, this fa- But the father has this advisor who's like a jerk, (laughs) Um, wants the kingdom. So he eventually stages a coup as they're growing up. He traps Torina. He wants to marry her so that he can become a legitimate ruler. Um, Meanwhile, the boy Langdon is kind of like escapes to another kingdom. You've got a look on your face. Okay, sidebar. One of the characters in my book that I've been writing, his name is Landon, and I think I now finally realize where I got that name from. <laughs> <laughs> wow. Yeah. Wow. Yeah. Wow, wow, wow. Good job. <laughs> Anyways, so it is it's kind of like a little politically oriented, but it's not like Game of Thrones or anything like that, but it's very fair, fairy tale esque and it's just so sweet and so fun. Mm-hmm. Um, we recommend you go read it. So, first one that I came up, this was at the back of my mind for a while. I read these when I was younger and I, ne- I couldn't remember what they were called, but it's the Universal Monsters series by Larry Mike Garman, and I'm thinking that. When we do our monster month, we're just going to do this book series <laughs> because the premise is teenagers Nina, Joe, and Bob decide to spend their summer working at Universal Studios. The project they're assigned to is pretty cool. It's a new technology that can transform classic movie monsters into life-size holograms, but something goes wrong and the monsters are digitally transported into reality. Now it's up to Nina, Joe, and Bob to hunt them down, starting with the most fearsome of all, Dracula. So the first book is Dracula, second is the Wolfman, third is Frankenstein, fourth is the Mummy, then Creature of the Black Lagoon is the fifth, and the sixth is the Bride of Frankenstein, and... 
being a lover of classical Hollywood old school monster movies, this <laughs> these books were so much fun. Wow. They're so much fun. And very few people that I know have read or heard of them. No, haven't heard of them at all except for you. Yeah. <laughs> so that's my uh your contribution. You can idea. find them on the book depository though. That's now that good. I now that I know what they're called. <laughs> How hard did you have to search trying to like figure out what these books were? I had to pretty much type a summary into Google. <laughs> and I, yeah that's how i found them okay so next one on my list is bring me the head of prince charming by <laughs> roger Z- uh, zelanzi and robert shecky that is an amazing title um this was a random library find and then i actually spent a good tier- two years trying to find a physical copy so i own this book oh, okay the Bring Me Ahead of Prince Charming is a, fa- a new fantasy series that will challenge the funniest the field has to offer from the creator of best- the best-selling Amber series and one of the genre's leading humorists. Azzy Evilbub, Demon, has had his sights set on the Millennial Evil Deeds Award given to the being whose acts do the most towards reshaping the world, but his plans go so far astray. So basically every thousand years at the turn of the century there is big tournament between good and evil they each have a representative and then whoever wins that contest gets to shape the next de- like thousand years how they see fit and so our main character decides i am going to take the fairy tale of sleeping beauty because everybody's nostalgic for these sort of things <laughs> And I am going to mess with it and corrupt the crap out of it. Oh and God. he tries to try so hard to make sure it fails. So, like, you know, the prince has bad bad eyesight, so he might kiss the wrong person, you know, up all the, like, things in the way. The princess has got this bad attitude. Like, it's so much fun. That sounds amazing. I'll have to lend it to you. Yeah, that sounds just like something you should just sit there and read and enjoy <laughs> and when i was doing research for this list i found out it's the first in a trilogy oh so even better <laughs> even better yeah demons and uh fairy tales yeah i'll take two of my favorite things i will take that okay the next one on my list i have because i, I actually read another book by this woman that she wrote recently and i did not like it at all i was really bored but this one has a very special place in my heart. It's called Pirates by Cecilia Rees. Um, and in this book, I can't exactly tell you what happens because I just remember chunks of it. But the basic plot is this girl, her father has died. So she ends up going to his plantation in like Jamaica where she's under the care of her f- brother. And she's on this plantation and she meets this girl who whose mother kind of was like the favorite slave of her father and they're they become friends but her brother wants to marry her off to this like other slave plantation owner across the way and um he's he's just like evil incarnate like he's kind of like described as like the devil in human form and he kind of has this this, like mysterious supernatural aura coming out of him he gives her like these like blood red rubies that just remind her of like drops of blood on her skin Mm -hmm. um So she does not want to marry this guy. He's, like, cruel to his slaves. Like, just, she cannot deal with him. So she and this girl that she meets run away together. And they decide that they are going to join this pirate band. And so they hop on this ship, and it is just this giant kind of, like, adventure as they, like, run away from this guy. They're pirates. She's actually in love with a soldier who's kind of, like, chasing her on his, like, British Navy ship. And just, it's so, it's kind of supernaturally, it's very kind of steeped in this kind of, like, plantation slave kind of thing. So it's very smart as well and just so well written. And you just come out of that just so happy and feeling so fulfilled. (laughs) People need to read this book. All right, next on my list is... A really, really, really cute kind of 9 to 12. Oh, okay. It's called Monsters in My One True Love, and it's by Diane Curtis Reagan. And it's I. It's also the last book in a quartet. I never read the first three. <laughs> but oh, wow. you can easily follow it. But basically, 
The last three monsters have, have arrived at Harmony House, bed and breakfast. Once again, Rila has got to think of a creative way to keep her family from finding out that they're actually alive. So basically, for Christmas one year, one of her family friends or uncles, I don't remember, gives her a subscription to this monster club, which means each month a monster is delivered to her door and they're like stuffed animal size little things. Okay. And so they're each like themed to do like November, the monster's name is Cranberry because, you know, Thanksgiving, American Thanksgiving. <laughs> But, so, da 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 but with lots of friends in town for Aunt Poppy's wedding, things get a little bit out of hand. Rowdiness rules the days as Rilla tries to juggle the wedding hoopla downstairs with the monster antics in her attic bedroom. And then there's her budding relationship with Joshua, who won true love. Will Rila's quick thinking keep her secret safe? Will she and Joshua ever have anything besides monsters to talk about? Because, of course, he's the only other person who knows she has all these monsters living in her attic. And the Monster of the Month Club Quartet is a charming and funny as its predecessors. This miniseries is perfect for re reluctant readers. This book was originally bought for my brother because he didn't <laughs> like reading books and I kind of stole it. Of course. <laughs> but it's so cute. Like, I can't get over how cute this book is. <laughs> <laughs> just like me it takes place at christmas time and it just gives you all these warm fuzzy feelings because you know like first romance and cute little funny monsters and you want cute little funny monsters and it's just i love it <laughs> it's just got all the things just got all the happy. things that make me happy and to this day if i'm still if i'm sick there is a good chance that i might read this book <laughs> that's sick in bed uh <laughs> that's great yeah so that's that okay um Next on my list, I have the Farsala Trilogy by Hilary Bell. This is a series that I would describe as something kind of like Game of Thrones. It's not as dark by a million and a half, but what kind of happens is there's this country, and they kind of have two classes of people. The ruling class who are supposed to defend the peasants, and the peasants are supposed to work the land. But of course, the ruling class takes advantage of the peasants, and things have been out of whack for a long, long time. You have three different characters kind of from different classes. You have the one girl from the ruling class who's like starts off like really bratty. You have her half brother who is um she kind of doesn't treat very well, but he's kind of his father's son. And then you have this merchant who's kind of been running around and he's kind of been abused by the ruling class. But then in comes this massive empire. And they're trying to take over the country because they've been taking control of countries like all around them. But what they do is they kind of like infiltrate a few years before, they learn the language, and then they have a year to take over this country entirely. Hmm. But I mean, they have massive resources, so that is how it's supposed to be. And if they don't take over this country in a year, then they just leave it alone and the country can do whatever they want. And so the first book is kind of them taking over the country and then the country's kind of almost won and the next two books are them kind of taking it back. And it's just one of the most fun reads if you like spies and insurgents and trying to like counter movements and that kind of stuff. And the characters are really well written. They have like a nice kind of character progression and you get really into it. Um, and I tried to read the first one and then I put it down and then I guess I was really bored one day and I picked it up again and started reading it and then I just couldn't stop. I had to read the whole thing again. All right. So my last one is... The Dirt Eaters from The Long White <laughs> Legacy by Dennis Foon. <laughs> so she made me read this series um, in high school, I guess. And I don't have, I don't remember much of what happens, but the stuff I remember is like a fever dream nightmare. <laughs> All right, let me give the plot. So you... <laughs> It's a struggle to survive on post-apocalyptic Earth. In the first book of the trilogy, The Long Light Reg Legacy, the wars have transformed the world and 16-year-old Roan is about to discover a terrible truth. When Roan's parents and the people of Long Light perish in a raid, Roan is filled with rage. Torn between his desire for revenge and the legacy of peace he has inherited, he is taken in by a sect of warriors. With them, he learns he has expectational talents as a fighter, but Roan is haunted by visions he can't understand. When he commits his first act of violence, he flees in disgust into the most wasted lands of all, the devastation. He meets friends and allies in unexpected places as his enemies hunt him down, but it is only when Roan meets Alandra and then begins to understand his life's purpose and why his village Longlight was destroyed. Dennis Foon has created an immensely powerful and disturbing book. I like how they use disturbing. 
<laughs> look at a wasted world. Through the character of Roan, hope and promise of renewed life is possible. There are three books, The Dirt Eaters, Free Walker, and The Keeper's Shadow. Yes. These books are messed up, and I absolutely love them. I think Canadian authors are famous for their just what the hell kind of writing style. I met this guy. I know this guy. He's cool. <laughs> He's <But> cool. <laughs> these books, like, definitely are one trilogy that messed with me when I was reading them. Like, I had nightmares. I was just so uncomfortable. There are these, there are these bugs, okay? There are these little weird, they're kind of, never really explained why they exist, but they, like eat your skin and your skin gets all pockety and so the one of the characters he's just they call him Mooney because his just his skin is all puckered and all these like craters from these bugs and you're pretty free like you're he's he's creepy like his origin story is creepy and then they're continuing on and they meet a girl who also had like an infl- infection of these bug things but they got down her throat oh. so she can't talk <laughs> it was just like, ah. Uh, oh. uh. I, I remember people who lived underground and filed their teeth. Yeah. That, that's what I remember. Lots of drugs. Lots of drugs. <laughs> there was also the, the fire, the, the ice cream truck, and the kids get excited for the ice cream truck when the ice cream truck's gonna come, but in fact, the ice cream truck, truck is taking them away, the way, taking them away to experiment on them. Wow. <laughs> yep, that is every kid's nightmare. So, yeah, read that to your children. I have been debating about rereading these books for a while. I think you should. And I think I'm going to have to. I think that's worth another read. Okay. <laughs> um, I kind of thought of another one while we were doing this, so I'm going to mention that as well. But the last one I technically have on my list is The Rope Maker by Peter Dixon. And this book was kind of alternative in that it doesn't feel like anything else you've ever read. There is this kind of society... They're living on one side of the woods and they manage to block themselves off from an empire on the other side. But the problem is their wards have actually begun to fall down and pretty soon this empire is going to come in and like just mess with their society. Mm -hmm. So they send out an envoy of people to go to the other side and deal, like find a way to put the wards up and they're looking for this one specific witch who's like impossible to find and their magic is different kind of from everything that you know it's not like an easy thing to do but it's important and the people who can kind of do it are very like well taken care of or they're just super powerful so they're looking for this one witch and this girl figures out that she can actually negate magic and just their adventure is so different from anything i've kind of come across that i've loved this book i read the sequel the sequel was not as good but um this was a book worth reading. And then the last book that I was thinking of, and I know you've read this, is The Sight by David Clement. Games. Oh, the wolf book. <laughs> to what, you didn't like it? I actually didn't really like it. Really? I'm not one for animal narratives. It was weird, though, because it had, like, this Bible-esque yeah. feel to it, which I found super, super interesting. It kind of, it had a lot of, yeah, Bible imagery. Bible kind of epicness to it of like the one chosen thing but it was with wolves so it was really weird and if you can kind of deal with that I guess you should pick it up there's like this prophecy about I don't know it was very pretty the language it was pretty but anyways finally now my favorite section of the podcast is Chelsea what have you been reading oh no (laughs) this is the section I dread because I'm like what have I been reading I'm reading something I actually read the first book of Tahiri Mafi's series, Shatter Me. All right. Um, and then I read the second little novella, and it's been pretty good so far. There is a ton of kissing. A ton. I think about a third of this book is them making out. <laughs> and it's starting to bug me. But then I started the next one, and, and they had one kissing scene, and I was like, okay, I'll give you the one, and then this needs to stop. And then it stops, and I'm like... Can we go back to kissing? This is getting really intense now, and I don't know if I can deal with this. (laughs) But, yeah. I mean, her kissing scenes are pretty intense. They're pretty hot. So you can get through it that way, but when it stops, be warned. You get a little scared. (laughs) And then I've kind of been flipping through Gone Girl. (laughs) Slowly. I'm just waiting for my sanity to break. I am finishing up my Halloween book this year was The Haunting of Hill House by Shirley Jackson and oh my goodness it's amazing 
It is so good. My first like uh, exposure to this story was the really, really, really bad adaptation. Like the two, the one in the two thousands. It is the book is so good. It's really short, but it's so good. You know, just gothic horror. Just ah, I love that stuff so much. <laughs> and yeah, is it like one of those haunted houses where it's like get out and the people refuse to leave? Kind of. It's. <laughs> I like the way how they described it because the the main character. She has spent the last, I don't know, like, seven years taking care of her, like, uh, her ailing mother, and she hated it, and her mother's just finally died, and now she's stuck with her sister, and her sister's horrible husband, and she's just so dominated by everyone around her, and so she gets invited to come out to this house, and so her mental state is so shaky that you get her, it's from her perspective, so you don't know if the stuff that's going on is really actually happening or if she's just finally cracking and the other there are three other people with her there's the doctor who set the up the experiment there's luke who is like related to the family that owns the house and then there's theodora who is like very she's very ambiguous because it's kind of alluded that she's a lesbian wait this is the one with um oh she's the nostalgia critic catherine zeta yes that's the one okay now i know exactly what you're talking about (laughs) and so her relationship the relationship between theodora and eleanor is really weird and interesting because you don't know it's like very like doubly like double entendre language and eleanor keeps asking her questions (laughs) and she keeps just like oh yes I, I lived with this friend, no, 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 my friend and I, and you just kind of know that there's something else going on there. And it's just, the house, how they describe the house is really cool, because it's just so wrong, and the angles are wrong. Like, mm. the the steps aren't actually flat. They're, like, curved down, like, because yeah. the guy didn't like straight angles. So, wow. it's, it's really good, and I really recommend it. Huh. Anyways. Yeah. So... Reading, yes. Um, it has been... I feel like it's going to be an eventful week. Oh, it's going to be a very eventful week. It's going to be a very eventful month, because not only do we have all of our book convention things, we also have a couple of small like conventions in Toronto, and it's November. So it's NaNoWriMo. So it's NaNoWriMo, and I am already behind. I'm 551 words into a story. <laughs> <laughs> wow. So Yeah. I'm impressed that you managed to do it every year. Um, as far as I am concerned, our reviews are my NaNoWriMo. I've only won, like, twice. Yeah. I'm slowly, like, I've actually been consistently writing. I wrote on Friday night. Halloween. So I'm impressed that I've actually managed to keep it up. And I finally just decided that I'm going to skip all the parts that I don't want to write right now. Well. <laughs> and just move on. I'm going to drag you out a lot this month to writing events. So. I have upgraded my writing utensils to a notebook. So. <laughs> everybody's going to be there with their laptops. And I'd be like, I'm, I'm writing old school. All right. So I guess that is the end of this week. And we will be seeing you guys in two weeks for our next podcast. Don't forget to check out our website, www.dofthea.com. Yes, okay, I've messed up <laughs> once. Stop giving me that look. <laughs> or follow us on Twitter at D of the A Reviews. Or you can follow me at Twitter at Zaries underscore Loki. Yes. And we're also on YouTube if you just look up D of the A Reviews. So yeah. We will be talking to you guys soon. Hi guys. 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 Hi gu